Thanks for the little intro into, segue into frogs there, um, Anne. Uh, so hi everyone, my name's Emily Hoffman. For those of you who don't know me, there's a few familiar and lots of new faces as well. Um, and today I'm yeah, really excited to be able to have the opportunity to talk to you about a project that I undertook during the, um, what I remember as sort of the sleepless or endless summer of 2014, 2015, <laughs> um, when I uh, looked at, um, when I was working, sorry, as a wetland ecologist for Juna. And um, yeah, so this project just looks at um, some critters that I find really interesting and some of the most incredible guys out there, frogs of course, and just how they respond to the management action of environmental watering at temporary wetlands. All right. Um, just for a bit of background, the motivation for this project came about in sort of late 2014 when um, the Natural Resources SAMDB uh, wetlands and floodplains team was planning to deliver um, environmental water to numerous priority temporary wetlands um, along the River Murray. So this map here just sort of gives you an idea of some of the spread of the sites all the way from Morgan nearly to the SA border. Um, and environmental watering has been talked about a lot um, in, in during this conference which is really fantastic and yeah really is just the concept of using or delivering water for environmental outcomes. So in this case we were pumping into dry temporary wetland sites in order to try and maintain or restore some of those key ecological um, values and um, processes at those sites. And frogs are often used as environmental indicators or used as targets um, at these watering sites or at, um, for environmental watering in general. All right, so why, why are we worrying about what frogs are doing? Apart from the fact that they're amazing and can hold up cardboard signs, which is pretty incredible in <laughs> itself. But for numerous other reasons, um, so ecologically, they're, they're really important in those floodplain um, ecosystems and um, they consume large numbers of invertebrates, detritus, algae, um, and they're also a food source themselves for other animals, so like birds. Um, they've been shown to be um, good indicators of wetland condition, um, but not to mention that I think of international conservation significance. So the IUCN has listed nearly a third of all amphibians globally as either being threatened or extinct. So a pretty shocking statistic. So I think with environmental watering becoming increasingly used in South Australia um, and across the basin, it's really important for us to understand just how these actions might be influencing frog populations in those areas. So what do we currently know sort of at that stage in late 2014? Well, we like Anne had said, we certainly could hear when we delivered water like something was happening. We could hear males responding. Uh, but there's actually little specific research look, looking at how frogs respond to environmental watering. And what had been done was largely interstate and looking at flooding and sort of larger scale events and not the specific type of watering that we were conducting in South Australia. So we're a little bit in the dark. And so yes, we had heard them responding at some sites from previous years watering, but um, a lot of the story was still unknown. So we were asking sort of questions like, well, if we're ca they're calling, does that mean that they're actually successfully recruiting into the population? Um, we, if so, which species? Was it all species or just some? Um, what sort of were their frog assemblages like? Maybe also how long does it take them to reach that stage, to reach successful development? And does that mean that there's maybe a minimal or optimal hydro period that these sites should have to, re to reach that stage? And then maybe how does timing influence this? And should we do top-up volumes? And on and on and on. Um, yeah, it gives you an idea. We sort of just got to the stage, I think we realised there was a lot of what we thought were really important but unanswered questions. Um, but given, uh, given that what we did know and from what we'd seen at sites previously, we hypothesised that these sites would be really fantastic grounds for frogs. Like we thought they would be top notch. Um, one of the, the photo on the right here is of one of the sites, Whirlpool Corner. And it sort of displays some of those characteristics that we sort of think are quite typical of these temporary watered sites. So they have really great water quality, fantastic inundated vegetation, good um, species diversity. Um, we get all these aquatic species coming up. So really great, what we thought were great conditions for frogs. And um, as well as that, due, due to this method of pumping water into sites, it largely excludes a lot of fish. So we thought that there might be lower rates of predation there as well. So even though there were a lot of um, unknowns, we we sort of had good grounds, I think, to, um, we hoped that their conditions would be really, really great for, for frog populations. So what we wanted to do with this opportunity of having all these sites watered is to um, just uh, somehow increase our knowledge so that we can use these um, sort of help adaptive management and species conservation in the future. 
So we chose to really start to look at those short-term typical um, objectives for sites for watering for frogs. Um, with those objectives usually being that environmental watering provides a really good breeding <coughs> opportunity for frogs. Um, so maybe like which species, what do their um, communities look like? And secondly, that environmental watering also provides adequate water, so in terms of its quality and duration, to allow for successful recruitment. So are they actually recruiting into the population and how long does that take? So we went out and did some survey work. So just really quickly, we sampled 37 sites across, across a dozen wetlands and uh, did monthly surveys after the water was delivered, so from December up until April after the water was delivered at these sites. Uh, we looked at frog, um, their species occurrences and their abundances using night surveys, so doing transect searches and oral call surveys, and also looked at tadpole um, abundance and their development stages using bike nets set overnight at some sites. But I will mention that was just done at a subset of sites, which I'm really thankful about because it turns out it takes a lot of time to do the, that part of the survey. Right, are you all on the edge of your seats? <laughs> I sure hope so, because I am. <laughs> Figure it is there. Um, so what happened? Well, in, in summary, breeding. So it's really widespread and really abundant. So um, we were really glad. Our breeding occurred at all of our sample sites, so across every single site, um, that, um, the watered sites. Excuse me. Um, and really high abundances of frogs and tadpoles. And I guess, what do I mean by high abundance? Just for an example, you, we might say over 1,000 tadpoles or over 100 frogs just in a single survey of a single sample site. So that, hence the long time bit that I was talking about earlier. Um, we recorded seven species of frog, which includes every frog species that we expected to see at those sites. And uh, fantastically, so um, recorded successful recruitment of all of those seven species through the presence of tadpoles or metamorphs. So some species were more common than others at these sites. Um, the three species that were most common are shown on the left there, and we recorded them at nearly every site. Uh, that's the spotted grass frog that we heard earlier. Thanks, Anne. Should have put in a music um, audio as well. Uh, Perrin's tree frog, eastern sign bearing froglet. Um, and some were less common, like the one in the top right there is a southern, southern bell frog. And, we record, and that's a nationally threatened species, sorry. And we recorded that at about 30% of our sample sites, survey sites. When we looked at the um, frog assemblages, we found them to vary with their geomorph region and hydro period, which was really interesting. So. If we look at the MS and MGS, say that three times in a row, plot um, on the left here, um, we can see, so each point just represents the frog assemblage at each of the watered sites. And we can see those in the valley, let's see how I go with this, yeah. Um, those sites in the valley, which are sites between the SA border and Lock 3, um, are clearly different from those um, in the gorge region, which is Lock 3 to Lock 1. Um, and that's sort of also sort of um, backed up by seeing um, when we look at the hydro period, so this is the length of time that each site was inundated with water, each of those water sites, and those with short and medium length hydro periods, um, so that's between about two and five months of inundation, um, looked a bit different from those um, with longer inundations um, of six months or more. So quite interesting. All right, so looking now over time, um, uh, the breeding was really, really immediate and quite rapid, so we seen, saw um, I'll just explain these plots here. So the top plot is showing just calling over time, so the proportion of sites that frogs were calling. And the bottom one is the mean number of tadpoles for each species over time. And they show a similar theme in that um, you can see for calling and tadpoles that there was both highest in December, so immediately after the water was delivered, and then decreased over time. But also showed that it was just one singular pulse event of breeding. And by April surveys, thankfully for me and my tiredness, that we started recording very few um, rates, that there was very low rates of calling and almost no tadpoles by April. Um, we started to get initial evidence of recruitment happening less than two months after watering for most species, which was, we thought was quite, um, quite rapid. And I like this figure here, um, it's quite cool, and it shows just the frequency of the development stages for one, this is just for one species, but um, just as an example, um, the parents tree frog. Um, over each month of surveys. So if we look, for what we're looking at from left to right is um, early to stage tadpoles that look sort of more like this tadpole here, and then as we move right, um, they represent uh, later stages of tadpole growth, more like this one here. So in December, there were lots of early stage tadpoles, as we would expect, but as soon as um, we did our January round of surveys, we were already seeing lots, like a shift and lots of um, 
a higher frequency of tadpoles in later stages of development and some reaching metamorphosis already. And this really complemented with what we were seeing on the ground. So we um, saw um, this graph here shows the mean number of metamorphs over time and shows that we didn't record any in December, a few in January, but really majority we were seeing in those sort of months, three to five months after watering. <coughs> So then, is it just a matter of adding water to these sites? Well, I think if we just go back to our initial um, questions, we could say from this example of what we're seeing um, here is that, yes, if delivering environmental watering in this way can certainly provide a breeding opportunity and for successful recruitment um, of frogs. And we've got a better idea, I think, now of the timing and, and duration that these things need to happen. So in the absence, perhaps, of um, flooding conditions or um, opportunistic breeding, um, good conditions for frogs, perhaps environmental watering could be used as an important management tool. Yet, of course, there's always many, many questions and some that we're um, hoping to investigate further now are perhaps why some species are more abundant than others um, and perhaps understanding the, ta um, the habitat requirements will help with this. Just how that hydro period might be affecting those metamorphs that are um, still hanging around the edges of the wetlands after watering. But also, and maybe most importantly, just how um, what are those larger, a broader scale, um, a larger scale implications of environmental watering for frogs? So how does it tie in, how does environmental watering tie in with, say, large scale flooding events or over longer periods of time? Must thank our, uh, before, lastly, quickly before I finish, I know I'm almost out of time, but I just want to thank the um, funding and environmental water sources and um, as well, I can't thank enough those amazing people and a few of them are here today. Thank you for coming out and um, helping with the field work and project guidance and Callie's fantastic photos. I've nabbed a few for this presentation um, and who gave up yeah, many hours of precious sleep to come and help with this project. So thank you all.